Comments and opinions expressed on Writers in Focus are those of the individual participants and are presented for the purpose of discussion only. No endorsements by Atlanta Fulton Public Library System or Fulton County Government are intended and none should be presumed. Hi, welcome to Writers in Focus. I'm your host, James Taylor, and today I'm delighted to have as my guest, Miss, or should I say, Dr. <laughs> Amber Dermont. May I call you Amber? Yes, yes. Welcome to the Atlanta Fulton Public Library so and the much. Fulton County Government Center. Uh, by way of introduction, uh, you, let's, let me, let me start uh, this way. We're going to talk about your latest book, Damage Control, a collection of 14 superb short stories. The New York Times endorsed the book as an editor's choice after a glowing re review just a few weeks ago. Uh, you've been reviewed favorably. You've been reviewed with, with gushing <laughs> e encomia from uh, Wall Street Journal, from Elle magazine, from Salon.com. Uh, as for me, I'm, I'm almost speechless, Amber. Uh, <laughs> you have come out of nowhere, it seems, sui generis and fully formed as a great fiction writer and yet you've only been publishing for the last couple of years, if I have that straight. Your, your first novel, uh, Starboard Sea, came out in 2012. Your yes. stories that we're going to talk about just came out. Um, are you following some kind of master plan? <laughs> I, I know that when you were nine years old, you told your parents that you wanted to go to the Iowa Writer's School? Yeah, I wanted to go oh, to the... Oh, come on. Is the, it really? When I was nine years old, I, I told my parents I was going to go to the Iowa Writers Workshop because that was where, where writers, where my heroes, where Flannery, Connor, and uh, Tennessee Williams went. And I just, uh, I always wanted to be a writer. It was the only thing I ever wanted. And I understood just how much work, how much discipline is involved. And I've been publishing short stories since about 2003, 2004. But I really, you know, wanted to. I, I, I believe in in patience and in taking your time with your work. And I'm always very. Whenever my students are, you know, like tell me, like, you know, they want to know how to get published, and I always think, well, we'll write something first. You know, really work on it. And so that, to me, was when I when I finally was going to publish my books. I wanted to be able to stand behind them, you know, completely and entirely. With me, uh, about a month ago, I was. Uh looking for an author. I do this show twice, uh, two authors a month, and I was reading a recent edition of Atlanta Magazine, not a, not a literary magazine, mm -hmm. but my dear friend Teresa Weaver has a page She's where wonderful. she, yeah, and she said, you've got to read this book, and so I, I picked it up and I started reading it, and I, I think I called you within 10 minutes and I said, <laughs> I've got to interview you. Um, does it surprise you that you have just made a literary splash. I mean, maybe you don't realize that, but to, in, in my world, you have. I mean, serious, high-quality literary fiction, we'll get to that in a second, <laughs> that makes you laugh, that makes you cry, that's entertaining, that's accessible. You've done it. Do you, do you ever think that you've, wow, I've done it? No. Good, oh, goodness, good. No, okay. never, you're, you're too never, young. not at all. No, I, I just, uh, I think that... Um, you know, that's really not for the writer. I always sort of think about the fact that um, your books, if you're a writer, should have a much more interesting life than you do. And they go out in the world and they make friends and they meet people and they go places that you as the author will never go and never know of. Um, but honestly, I don't, I don't think that way. I'm, I'm very... Um, I spend probably like 98% of my time by myself um, just writing and working. And so I don't, uh, it, it's not even on, on you know, the radar for me. Uh, my brother, who's a wonderful, wonderful person, uh, threw me a, a really lovely book party in New York last week. And it was so great to have all my friends there. And I just looked around the, the restaurant and I thought, you know, I'm so lucky. I have so many beautiful, wonderful friends. And so many of them are writers. Um, and you have that sort of moment of, of celebration, and then I went, I went back to my hotel room by myself, and I just sort of, you know, thought like, okay, back to work. Yeah. You know, sort of like you have those little moments of, of like where you do need to celebrate and mark it, 
but then you have to you have to just get back to work. You're going to have to forgive me with some of my questions because sure. I've, I've immersed myself in your <laughs> life for the last couple of weeks. I, I know where you were born, your par what your parents did for a living, uh, you, you've got a precocious nephew, all, all kinds of stuff. <laughs> but let me kind of start the conversation off, the serious conversation, by a crazy question. Sure. Um, I taught a workshop in publishing uh, a couple of years ago, and everybody thinks that they have a story to tell, mm -hmm. but they don't necessarily have the talent. Or someone might have a great story, mm -hmm. uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, do you see a dichotomy in, as, a, as a teaching instructor at Agnes Scott with a PhD in creative writing and English literature? Do you see a dichotomy between a writer with a lot of talent who doesn't know what to say um, this is a difficult, it's a stupid question, but <laughs> there are great, there are wonderfully talented writers mm -hmm. who don't write about interesting subjects. Harold, I'll start, Harold okay. Bloom once said that uh, John Updike is a great writer, but he doesn't address great subjects. He'll never go down in the canon of great English literature. Um, what I, you seem to do both. I guess my question is, and I'm going to get off this awkward diving <laughs> board of TV, and say, <clears throat> what, how do you find subjects to write about? Sure. I, I've got 14 stories in front of sure. me, and they're all different. How do you find? Well, I mean, I think... So thank you, you for know, getting for, me off no, that diving no, board. No, no, of course. And I mean, I think that, you know, what you, you said about Updike, I mean, Updike is a curious example because he's someone who is so compelled and moved by domesticity and infidelity, and that was really the, the thing that drove much of his writing. And then if you look at someone like... Philip Roth, who's had a real transformation and become, a, you know, a fairly highly political yeah. writer um, and a writer who's really writing for history. Um, and I think that in both those cases, the the subject matter to me, um, they're writing ultimately out of their own hearts and their own desires, and that's really where you want to be as a writer. Everybody has one great story to tell, and it's the story of their life. And some people are able to tell it in multiple different ways from different angles and different approaches, and um, with my short stories, often it's like the sort of most um, extreme or like sort of shocking detail that you think like, well, clearly she made that up. Like that's usually the thing that's true. <laughs> and then I have to sort of go and construct the world around it um, so that, and I, and I, I never really want to betray too much about like what's real and what's not just because I think it's, it's ultimately for the reader to experience. I heard you know. say in one interview a few weeks ago that, uh, it often surprises you that the crazy stuff in your writing has happened to yeah, you, more or less, yeah, yeah. and you make up the mundane. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's what that's that's sort of my, my approach. And I think you just have to be present, and you have to be aware, and you have to sort of witness. witness. Um, when I was, one of the first short stories I wrote is a story called The Order. And um, when I was seven years old, my mother and I were driving. Okay, um, folks, folks, The Order. <clears throat> Third story in the collection by Amber Durant in Damage Control. A 24-year-old woman is a caretaker of her grandmother. Mm -hmm. She's taking her grandmother to a Carmelite nun's convent. Yes. And there's a scene where the nuns go bowling. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> where did that come from? Well, I mean, I did, I did in fact, take my grandmother <laughs> to a Carmelite nun to see her, her best friend who was, who was dying. And, and Carmelites are very curious because they're, they're cloistered. Yeah. And so you can't just like easily go and visit them. And when you when you do set up that that visit, um, you can't touch or hug. There's a wall. There's a screen that's be always going to be between you and um, and the nuns. So it's a very surreal experience. Um, it's a very surreal story yeah, too. It's yeah. great. Well, and the the beginning of that story uh, comes out of something I witnessed. Um, the first line in the story is like, you know, when the baby fell out of the car, she bounced twice. I was going to have you read that. Okay, yeah, that's, yeah. that's amazing. And um, when I was seven years old, my mother and I were driving, and um, we were going over this little tiny bridge, and the car in front of us, uh, the passenger side door swung open, and a baby fell out of the car. And the baby bounced twice. And I was seven years old. My mother stopped. The car behind us stopped. Um, we were very close to a, a, f a fire station. The woman who was behind us got out of the car, and she was a, happened to be a nurse. And the mother was very, very young, the mother of the baby, then the driver of the car in front of us. 
And um, somehow it was decided in all the chaos that I would hold the baby. So I'm seven years old. I'm holding this baby who's just fallen out of a car. We drive to the fire station. And um, we get to the fire station, and um, we walk in, and there's this fireman. And he, when he sees the young mother, the child, he looks at her, and he says, you again. And, you know, my own mother, of course, was like, let's get out of here, you know. And as a writer, you know, even at seven years yeah. old, I was like, I want to stay. I want to know, what, like, what is the story here? And so that event stayed with me forever. And I always knew I wanted to make a story out of it. And, um, and yet it's, it's such a, you know, in life, things happen to you out of nowhere. And um, you can't really, in fiction, it's all about shaping and structuring. So when I was writing that story, I thought, I know that I want to have this, this baby, um, you know, appear but I have to warn the reader that it's going to happen. And that's the only way I can get away with it as a writer. I Otherwise, it was, it's a, I th- sort I thought of special it was a, effect. I thought it was a brilliant trope. It had me thinking of metafiction. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think you know what I'm talking about. Oh, where of course, like, yeah, yeah. The author is telling you what's going to happen. Draw and, uh, attention you to become, the writing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so the, that really happened to well, you. Well, yeah, and the great <laughs> thing is, is that when I read that story, half of the audience sort of says, I'm not going to forget. Yeah, I'm yeah, yeah. remember yeah. that. And, yeah. and so they pay really close attention. And then the other half is like, oh, I'm, I'm going to forget. And so they sort of sit back. And, and it's always a surprise. Like that moment in the story, when I read it, I know it's effective if, if everyone in the audience sort of comes to life at that moment. Um, Your stories are so good. Um, I'm just going to move right ahead. Uh, a splendid, they're all of my 14 stories in this collection, uh, Damage Control. In A Splendid Wife, I'm looking at my notes, the wives of doctors mm. are disappearing. There are clues everywhere, but mm. no evidence. Yes. And they all, to be, they all seem to be cases of, and here I crack up, of intimate femicide, yes. which sounds like a personal product that you buy at CVS. Yeah. Uh-huh. And so a couple of days ago, I said, wait a second, did she make that up? And you're the kind of writer that, like, hmm, you're a fiction writer, but you're making me go to the Internet and Google intimate femicide is a phenomenon. Yeah, it's, it's a, a real thing. Yeah. Uh, does it st- was your intent to be humorous? Well, it's I, a, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm cracking up right now. No, 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 no. I mean, I think that there was a, when I first started working on that story, I, I was actually, um, to go back to the order, I was living at my... Ex- explain to the audience yeah. what intimate femicide intimate is. Intimate femicide is basically, you know, this sort of... Um, you know, men killing their wives or the women they are most intimate with, and the, the various stages of of their denial of of such an act. And there was a period, you know, I, I I'm always sort of stunned by how easy it is to kill your wife, or how um, easy to like the more extreme the case, uh, the more sort of violent, um, the, the 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 greater likelihood that you'll you'll no, you know, the man will get the, off. The, and the, so. the story is. So, I want you to continue in a, minute, in a minute, but the story is so well done. It works on many many levels, but it's almost like a Marx Brothers work of fiction where this one scene where. Um, the investigator, the police investigator, says there's blood on the steering wheel that matches the, the disappeared wife, but uh, that's that we with this inadmissible. We don't we don't consider that evidence. And uh, the husband uh, has uh, blood all over his hands, but uh, this coincides with a recent squirrel attack. Yeah. And I go, yeah. what? Yeah. <laughs> no, it's. I always sort of like to think like you know to to make you completely destabilize as a reader. I love to it. Make I you love laugh. it. And then you're sort of horrified at yourself. I like to indict the reader as much as possible in the process. And so when I started. Um, working on this story, there were a lot of, there was like the sort of Scott Peterson case and all of these cases of men, sort of Ro- um, Robert Blake, killing their wives, obviously O.J. Simpson. And, and I just was, was fascinated by the, the circus, the media circus around all of these events. And there's a, the sort of a circus at the end of the, the story, but also just how the lives of the women were sort of lost in all of this, you know. And um, I... I like to be, you know, if possible, subversive with my use of humor because I think humor has to has to do more than just make you laugh. It really has to, you know, like just you know speak to our most primal yeah, based yeah. desires and hopes and fears. And so in this story, um, I uh, I kind of use the the, the hard boiled detective novel 
Um, but the it's, detective it's is, it's you know, sort of, uh, you know, has his own private loss, and um, his, it's, his wife you know, disappeared. Yeah, <laughs> she too is 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 a, but um, but it's a. It's it's a, it's my father's favorite story of mine, okay. which I always think is so funny. Um, he loves my mother very very much, but he it's it's the story of his that he just thinks is like. Let me segue you know. into that because a lot of these stories involve uh, young women uh, and young men mm -hmm. and their parents yes. and grandparents. Uh, there are Jesuits, there are Carmelites in your stories. Uh, there are librarians. Yes. There's even a, an allusion on page uh, 68 to my home city of Worcester, Massachusetts. Yeah. You talk about two colleges there, Clark mm -hmm. and Holy Cross. I love that. Um, my question is this, that are you getting support from your parents? Because oh, yeah. this, there's some stuff in here that it was, did you, you actually wrote that about me? Oh, no, well, I mean. The my... pot smoking deceased father <laughs> in the first story, Lyndon. <laughs> My father, my father likes to joke that you who's, know, who's I, killed by you know, ladybugs. Yeah, I always kill off the dad in like the first sentence. He's like first paragraph. The dad's gone. You know, yeah. nice job. But no, my parents are rare book dealers, yeah. and so I grew up in a home that was like filled with antiquities. And um, my parents have a profound appreciation yeah, was for, it a library for literature. Where everything is for sale. Um, it was, and that's really the, the sort of the heartbreak of it all, because yeah, you would see yeah. these books that would be your friends or these documents, and they would they would you know yeah. offer they, me something, to, right, like right. well, you have to you know have to pay for your children to go to college, and so um, I I was very lucky to grow up with parents who were not only supportive but they understood the power of literature, and they understood you know my sister's an artist, my brother um, is a banker, but he has very art artistic uh, disposition, um, and I I think that. Um, my parents' sense of humor is really something that shaped me. My mother's probably the funniest person I've ever met, and she's just very, very body and wild in, in her humor. And she's she was a nun, and so you sort of look at her, and she's this gorgeous, beautiful woman, and the things that come out of her mouth are, are, are just, you know, sort of brilliant and cutting. And um, I gave her a, a reading last week, and my parents were in the audience. Fantastic. And I was, you know, sort of reading this story, and there was a lot of sex in the story, and everybody was terrified of laughing because my parents were there. And at the end, my mother was like, oh, please, you know, you should hear what we say. So, I mean, they, they've always been very supportive of me. And story number 11, Afternoons in the Museum of Childhood. Yes. Recent child abductee. She's pre-adolescent almost, her, yes. her body's just forming. She's been abducted by a kind of a Jesus freak. Her parents take her to Scotland, mm -hmm. and she learns that she's in a hotel where Robert Louis Stevenson wrote a book, yes. and she wants to go swimming. Yes. And she ends up going swimming naked with an attendant and your parents don't mind that? No, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm no. kidding. I'm kidding. I mean, they don't, I mean, I'm they, just saying yeah, that makes yeah, me, yeah, wow. Yeah, they just, I mean, and I think, too, it's often, um, you know, writers are looking for permission. That You have yeah, to, like, yeah. give yourself permission to write about something. And I've never had any hang-ups about writing about sex or, like, my, my sister-in-law wants, there's, like, a, like a masturbation scene in, in the story of Stella, Stella at the Winter Palace. And my, my sister-in-law, who I adore, yes, she yeah. was like, you know, aren't you embarrassed that your your parents will read that? And I just thought, no, I don't. I mean, and first of all, because it's it's fiction, and so you have that veil. Um, none of this is is me. This is these are the stories and the worlds that I'm attempting to create. And also, I think if you if you pull back, um, then you you're you're really hurting your stories. You know, you you shouldn't. You have to go yeah. sort of full full force. One one more example of this in story number twelve, which. Should, not a traditional story, not a traditional narrative, but I nevertheless, nevertheless, I, I loved it. Notes towards an anatomy of pain, very similar, my notes say, very similar to your, to your own youth when you started shaking after a dance yeah. class. And these notes are like very moving, uh, very painful to read, kind of funny. And I kept on thinking, what, her, what are her parents in the story thinking? And then I'm thinking about your own parents because you came, well, you started shaking one time yeah. when you were 13 and it lasted a long time. Yeah, when I was... Um, I you're, you're cool, you know that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but I mean... Yeah, I, I, I do, I do. I, you're, I, a, you're a cool writer. I had this very strange thing happen to me when I was little. And you're sort of lucky when you're a writer if you have weird things happen to you. It's, it's not a bad matter. You know, any yeah. sort of tragedy, anything. Um, but I was a dancer, and um, I came home from a, from a dance class. And um, I was sitting on my parents. They had this this salmon chaise lounge, and I was sitting on it, and I was watching 
the love connection. <laughs> and, I remember that. And uh, with Chuck Willary's Two Minutes and Two Seconds. He was the sort of, you know, very famous uh, game show host. And um, the left side of my body started shaking. And um, for years afterwards, my dad would make fun of me. He would start, like, shaking his leg and say, like, who am I? Guess who I am, you know? So there, there was really no, you know, there, there was always humor in it. Um, but it, it, it shook for a month. And even when I was sleeping, um, and so you you sort of have these, and I was I was sick a lot when I was a kid, um, and so you have these things happen to you, and you try to make sense of them. And I originally wrote that piece as a, a kind of lyric essay, and it was it was published um, by John Degata in the in the Seneca really? Review, and um, I reformulated it a little bit for for the for the short story collection. I knew I wanted it to be in there. It's it's a strange hybrid piece. Um, and I, I, I never want to write the same story twice, so I'm always trying out new forms and new approaches, uh, or I hope I am. But with that story, it's a very personal story, and it's, um, you know, it's, it's in many ways about the moment when I became a fiction writer um, and what, what sort of went into that um, and how, how I ultimately dealt with this, this, this inexplicable thing that happened to me. Which makes me think of... <clears throat> Another interview I heard you do, I think on the West Coast, and you were talking to someone far younger than I am, <laughs> and how you as a fiction writer, rather than be fearful of the Internet, you've embraced the Internet and metafiction and blogs, and you talked about readers' expectations about narrative structure have mm -hmm. changed. You're, and you're, you're a bona fide Ph.D. writing instructor and scholar of the language, has it changed for you? To, I mean, has it? Can, have you felt a sea shift in in readers' yeah. expectations? I mean, I think that the um, there's a kind of impatience, and I think that uh, you know readers are very sophisticated, and they're they're sophisticated in their understanding of narrative, um, and so they maybe don't require as much setup. You know, um, everything to me is sort of plot. Like I'm I'm rarely surprised by life because I can always sort of like anticipate or try to. Um, but I think that the um, the challenge then is to to really um, exceed and subvert those readers' expectations. And I think of someone like Donald Barthelme, who's one of my favorite writers, um, someone I've studied um, with great care, and um, he helped found the the University of Houston's oh, PhD yeah. program where where I studied. And um, his you know you really felt his presence there. He was he was gone you know long gone at that point, but. Um, his, his wife, uh, Marion Barthelme, who was a brilliant supporter of the program, um, she, she was someone who had this just kindness and grace, and, and I was just fascinated by their relationship, but also by his ability to just make it new, always. And um, you know, there's this famous, uh, I, I believe it was T.C. Boyle once asked John Cheever, like, aren't you upset, you know, there are all these young writers and they're, you know, experimenting and you know, how do you feel about that? And uh, Cheever said, you know, every time I write a story, it's an experiment. And I think of Cheever and Barthelme always as these sort of touchstones, like the, like I'm, I, the, the high lyricism of Cheever, the, the profound subversive wit and imagination of Barthelme. And that's really ultimately, I think, um, you know, you see that in some of the great uh, great writing that's going on right now um, and how it's being captured online. There are all of these sort of wonderful, um, you know, experimental journals that have figured out how to include digital media and poetry. Born Magazine is an example of that. They're, they're great, really smart editors who are looking for, um, you know, difficult material. Um, and uh, supporting it, um, a friend of mine, Jill Meyer, just started a an imprint called Strange Objects, and um, their uh, first book is going to be this book by this woman, Kelly Luce, and I know it's going to be genius. And she's this very, very smart, very uh, intense writer. And so I'm I'm excited about, and I think that the internet supports, um, you know, it's, it supports risk taking. One thing I really admire about your writing, Amber, is that you've mixed the best of both worlds, the academic world with people like Barthel May and people that you don't ordinarily read unless you've gone to college and stuff <laughs> like that. And you've gone to a lot of universities. So let, I'm leading up to, the, to a, a basic question. Um, you have studied with the best. 
you have degrees from in creative writing from at least two colleges. The Iowa School, you had a, the coveted fellowship uh, at the Iowa Writers Workshop, uh, University of Houston, a PhD in English Literature and Creative Writing. I'm thinking about the student, uh, the, the would-be writer out there in the audience who, who says, like, is it worth it, though, to go to all those colleges? And she knows, she knows so much, but do I have to go to school and sit at the no. knees of geniuses? Oh, gosh, no. But you know what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah, no, I think that there's no one right, true way to do it. Great and, answer, great answer. You know, I'm, I mean, ultimately, um, you know, I, I, was, I was always pretty good at being in school. Um, uh, and it was something that uh, gave me deadlines. And um, shame is a powerful motivator for me. So um, if I know that I have to hand in a story and I know that there will be, you know, 15 people who will make fun of me if I don't yeah. hand it in, you know, it'll, it, that story will, will be written. Um, and I think that that's one of the great things. And also, you know, the, the Creative Writing Workshop, it just accelerates it's, it accelerates the, the learning process. Everything has contributed to the fact that you are a wonderful writer. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been talking to Amber Dumont. We've been talking about her latest book. It's a collection of 14 short stories called Damage Control. She lives in the, our very midst, and she, you're destined <laughs> to become a great, great writer. Thank you for being Thank here. Thank you so much. Thank that you so by. much. That went by. Comments and opinions expressed on Writers in Focus are those of the individual participants and are presented for the purpose of discussion only. No endorsements by Atlanta Fulton Public Library System